Hello everyone and welcome to this session on Brexit and data protection. My name's Eleanor Deuce, I'm a lawyer at Phil Fisher in London and with me is my colleague Sebastian Georgescu. This is part of our Get Data Protection Fit series. We've now reached module four and we've talked about cookie law compliance, direct marketing, the NIS directive, the P2B regulation, and today we're going to be focusing on Brexit and data protection. By the end of this session, you should be able to explain the main Brexit developments that are expected by the end of this year, how these developments will impact on data protection, and finally, the impact on both UK and EU companies. So first I'm going to take you through an overview of where we are now and then Sebastian is going to look in more detail at some of the main Brexit developments that we're expecting by the end of this year. And I ought to point out, because this webinar could go out of date much more quickly than some of the other Get Data Protection Fit sessions. It's now the 18th of November and at this point we don't know if there's going to be a trade deal between the UK and the EU and we don't know if the UK is going to get EU adequacy. So everything is up in the air. Things may calm down and become clear very soon after this webinar but that's the position we're at today, the 18th of November 2020. So where are we now? Well, currently we're in the Brexit transition period. And what does that actually mean? Well, the UK left the EU on the 31st of January, but ever since we've still been subject to the EU treaties and treated for most purposes as if we're still an EU member state. So that's meant continuity. The GDPR still applies to the UK in the way that it did before. And the real change is visible in Brussels rather than elsewhere because the UK isn't represented in any of the EU's institutions. But other than that, the UK is, to all intents and purposes, very much as it was when it was an EU member state and EU law still applies to the UK. So what's going to happen at the end of this transition period? There's a possibility that the transition period might be extended. There are intense negotiations going on at the moment between the delegations of the EU and the UK, and it may be that it appears that a breakthrough is going to be possible, but a little bit more time is required. And therefore, it may well be that this transition period is extended for a short period of time in order to allow both sides to ratify any agreement. Another possibility uh, is that, in fact, things move very quickly, a deal is agreed uh, and um, is put through in time for the end of this year, so the 31st of December 2020, which is when the transition period is currently expected to end. We expect any trade deal between the UK and the EU to be relatively limited in scope, but nonetheless, there is potential for that deal to be finalised by the end of the year. The final option, which I think is probably less likely now than it uh, might have been um, had we had a Trump administration in the US, um, is a no deal. Uh, so um, while still a possibility, uh, commentators are saying that uh, things have shifted since the election of uh, President-elect Biden and that a no deal is now less likely. So what's going to happen in the UK at the end of the transition period? Well whatever happens, be it a no deal scenario or a limited deal, in most areas, the relationship between the UK and the EU in terms of reciprocal rights and obligations and all of those aspects of being an EU member state will stop. So there might be a limited deal, but in most areas, the 
reciprocal relationships end on the 31st of December of this year. And so what happens in most areas where there was EU law is that that law is saved into UK domestic law so that there aren't big gaps in our economy in terms of how it's regulated or big changes. So EU law will be saved into UK domestic law. And the law in the UK which implemented EU obligations will also be saved. And that creates continuity because everyone knows what the law is, even though the relationship with the EU has come to an end. And that law that the UK is going to save into its domestic law, that EU law that becomes UK law, and also the domestic law that implements EU obligations together um, form a new body of law in the UK domestic legal system called retained EU law. Thank you very much, Eleanor. So whether or not the UK will get an adequacy decision by the end of the transition period has been a hot topic of debate in the data protection world. But why is adequacy so important? Under the GDPR, there is a general restriction to transfer personal data outside of the European economic area. The restrictions are designed to ensure that businesses cannot circumvent the protections of the GDPR simply by processing personal data in another jurisdiction. These restrictions do not apply, however, if personal data is transmitted to a country that is deemed by the European Commission to provide an adequate level of protection. So, in effect, adequacy means that the European Commission has determined that a country offers an adequate level of data protection, taking into account its domestic legislation and international commitments. Once achieved, this enables personal data to flow freely from the EU to that country. And examples of countries which already benefit from an adequacy decision include Argentina, New Zealand and Canada. Article 45 describes the regime of adequacy and how it, uh, adequacy decisions are issued, but it was the Court of Justice of the European Union that gave more context to what adequacy means. And in effect, it means essentially equivalent. So the third country who is applying for the adequacy decision should provide a level of protection for personal data, which is essentially equivalent to that provided uh, in the EU. The European Commission is the key player when it comes to issuing the adequacy decision, and it will look at things like the rule of law of the country, respect for human rights, and fundamental freedoms, but also whether the applying country has effective and enforceable data subject rights. So on the face of it, after the transition period, the UK will be a third country for GDPR purposes, so not having an adequacy decision can clearly be problematic for the UK and UK, comp and UK companies, but as well as EU companies, as it will be the EU controllers that will have to put additional measures in place. In the next slide, I'll talk about some potential hurdles that may get in the way of the UK's adequacy decision. So what are some potential stumbling blocks? Well, the first obvious hurdle to discuss is time frame. As mentioned before, the European Commission has to consider quite a number of things when assessing adequacy. In terms of the process, once the European Commission has completed its assessment, it will issue a draft decision. This draft decision is sent to the European Data Protection Board, which is composed of representatives of the 27 EU data protection authorities, who will then issue an opinion. Then the European Commission, uh, Commission will issue its decision, and then in the final stage the decision has to be approved by all of the 27 EU member states and the full college of the commissioners of the European Commission before the adequacy decision is formally adopted and comes into force. There are clearly many steps involved, and in terms of timing, it usually takes several years and up to 10 years for a country to receive an adequacy decision. But, as the UK is a departing member state, it is in a different position to other countries. So whilst the UK's aim to get adequacy by the end of the transition period is ambitious, it's not unrealistic. The GDPR also provides for periodic reviews of the decision every four years. Now, furthermore, as another a potential stumbling block. The UK PM uh, Boris Johnson said in a written statement made to the House of Commons that the UK will develop separate and independent policies after leaving the EU, and this will be in a range of different fields, including data protection. This has caused a debate about the possibility the UK may diverge from the European data protection framework. However, the latest position and the latest guidance that has, that has come out very recently from the UK government makes it clear that the plan is to have the UK GDPR to keep the same standards as the EU and to obtain and retain an adequacy decision. The only caveat here is that the UK has made it clear that it wants to develop its own international transfer mechanisms, so we may see a difference in approach on this point. 
there will also be some divergences in terms of uh, how the law is interpreted, but I will touch on that further in the presentation. Now, another point to note, although it's not necessarily a block to adequacy, it's the UK Investigatory Powers Act. Now, recently, the Court of Justice of the European Union held that the e-privacy directive precludes national legislation from requiring providers of electronic communication services to carry out a general and indiscriminate transmission of certain types of user data and to provide such data to security and intelligence agencies for the purpose of safeguarding national security. The Investigatory Powers Act in the UK has exactly those types of provisions, and potentially the European Commission, in its process of assessing the laws and data protection standards in the UK, could focus on such provisions and conclude that the appropriate standards are not met. Discussions on the Investigatory Powers Act have existed in the UK for a while, but we don't anticipate this will be a block to UK receiving adequacy, especially as there are similar legislations in place in existing member states such as France. Now, if the UK does not receive an adequacy decision by the end of the transition period, UK companies will have to make our arrangements to identify the data which came from the EU before the 31st of December 2020. Different legal obligations are likely to apply to that data compared with UK data, and we'll touch more on this later in the presentation. So what happens if the UK do not receive an adequacy decision by the end of the transition period? Effectively, there are two main bits of legislation that we need to consider to form a picture of what data protection would look like post-transition period in the no-adequacy scenario. These are the UK GDPR and the withdrawal agreement, specifically Article 71.1, and I will, look, uh, I will look at each in more detail in the following slides. As touched upon before, the UK will, uh, at the end of the transition period, turn the GDPR into national legislation, which means that the UK data protection law after the transition period will be by and large the same as EU data protection law. But turning to how the UK GDPR will be interpreted, it's important to know that for continuity, the UK will uh, save past case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union in its domestic legal system. So all EU case law prior to the transition date will also be UK case law. That being said, future case law, uh, so in other words, Court of Justice of the European Union decisions after the transition period, will not be binding on UK courts. There is also an element of uncertainty here, because the UK is poised to legislate to allow UK appeal courts to depart from the Court of Justice of the European Union case law where it is right to do so. This could cause relatively rapid divergence between the meaning of the GDPR and the UK GDPR. Further, it could mean that established principles of EU law are re-litigated after the end of the transition period. The withdrawal agreement between EU and UK has provisions that relate to data protection as well, specifically Article 71 and in particular Article 71.1. If the UK is not granted EU adequacy, the withdrawal agreement steps in and Article 71 applies. Now, Article 71 is high level, and it interacts with a complex web of the remainder of the withdrawal agreement and various Brexit legislation. Therefore, a number of aspects of how it may apply in practice remain to be confirmed in subsequent legislation and guidance. So, now looking at Article 71 in more detail. Article 71.1 protects what I will refer to as legacy data. Legacy data is personal data that has either come from the EU to the UK during UK's membership of the EU or during the transition period. Such legacy data has to be protected, according to the withdrawal agreement, in accordance with the GDPR. And note here that this is a reference to the GDPR as frozen at the end of the transition period. Therefore, if the UK does not receive an adequacy decision from the EU, GDPR protection will apply to such legacy data together with past and future case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So, as we've seen, after the end of the transition period, there will be quite a few sources of data protection law at play. To reiterate, these will be the UK GDPR, if the UK does not get EU adequacy by the end of the transition period, the frozen GDPR, that applies to legacy data, as mentioned in the previous slide, and the EU GDPR itself. Now, you can imagine that there is a high potential for divergence based on these sources of law, especially depending on how the courts, the UK courts, will end up interpreting the UK GDPR, and as well as 
how the direction of data protection law, what direction data protection law will take at a European level. So how will all of this impact companies? Now to make it clear from the outset, Brexit, in terms of data protection law, will have an impact not only on UK companies, but also on EU companies. To illustrate, Article 3 of the EU GDPR has extraterritorial scope, and because the UK GDPR mirrors the EU GDPR, it will apply to EU companies. Now, the UK GDPR will apply to any controls and processors based in the UK, as well as those outside the UK, but which offer goods and services in the UK or monitor the behavior of UK individuals. The UK GDPR will therefore continue to have extraterritorial effect in the same way the GDPR currently does. Many controllers and processors, whether based outside of the European Economic Area or in one of the remaining European Economic Area countries, will now also need to consider the requirement to appoint a representative in the UK. This will impact both non-EEA controllers and processors who may have already appointed a representative in a non-UK member state, as well as EEA controllers and processors who don't have a UK presence and for whom this will represent an entirely new obligation. Equally, the ICO have also indicated that a UK-based controller or processor that does not have any offices or establishments in the European Economic Area but offers goods or services or monitors the behaviors of European Economic Area individuals will need to consider appointing a European representative. So, as a conclusion, there are many potential new strands of data protection law in the UK that will come into play after the transition period. And depending on the uh, European Union's decision regarding adequacy, these will, uh, these will impact both UK companies and EU companies. Now I'll pass on to Eleanor, who will look at some practical considerations that flow from everything we've discussed so far. So what practical considerations do you need to take into account in order to prepare for the end of the Brexit transition period? Well, if the UK doesn't receive an EU adequacy decision, then you'll need another mechanism in order to transfer data from the EEA to the UK. So that's most likely to be standard contractual clauses not made easier because we've just had some new draft standard contractual clauses and everyone is asking, might those be adopted by the end of the transition period? There's a consultation on them at the moment and that's going to close in early December. So could they be adopted before the 31st? I think that's probably unlikely, but not entirely to be discounted. However, the new model clauses do have a provision which allows you to rely on the old standard contractual clauses for a year. So if you've got a really important data flow that really needs to continue after the end of the transition period, then you may be better off simply putting in place the current standard contractual clauses and replacing those um, in due course with the new model clauses. Now, if you transfer data on the basis of binding corporate rules and your lead regulator for the binding corporate rules was the information commissioner in the UK, then you will have already had to move those over to a new regulator in the EU and certain changes will need to be made. For example, the liability accepting entity can no longer be in the UK but needs to be moved to an EU entity. Privacy notices may need to be updated as a result of Brexit as well. So you may have references to the EEA, which currently include the UK, and that will need to change because the UK is no, no longer within the EEA. So those privacy notices might need to be updated. And this is also perhaps a good chance to update your Article 30 records and your um, records of processing so that they're up to date as well in terms of data flows, showing which data flows are EU data flows and which are UK data flows which no longer fall within the uh, within the definition of EU. If you benefited from the one-stop shop uh, and your lead authority was the ICO, again that's going to change the uh, 
regulatory cooperation mechanisms in the GDPR will no longer apply to the UK. And so you may find that the one stop shop mechanism no longer um, applies to you. That's an analysis that you'll need to do and consider whether another um, of your uh, entities um, could be the lead entity in relation to the one stop shop. And data protection breaches as well will change because the regulatory uh, cooperation framework of the GDPR will no longer apply in the UK. So you, meet, you may need to notify any data breaches um, both in the UK and um, in an EU member state, depending on how that breach has come about and who it affects and what territories um, it has affected. You may also need to look at uh, your Article 27 representative. Um, are they uh, appointed in the UK, for example, as your EU representative? If so, then you may need an, a UK representative, so you may be able to leave that representative in place, but you may also need to appoint a new representative in the EU. So those are some practical steps. Um, I hope now that you feel better able to explain the main Brexit developments which are expected at the end of this year, how those impact on data protection and the impacts on UK and EU companies. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.